Hi, everybody. Uh, I thought we'd talk about planes a little bit today. And any of you that have watched some of my shows here on Arch Topry know that I love to use the plane. I try to use them every chance I get. And I just wanted to talk a little bit about how planes are made and uh, how they work and how they can be usefully modified to help us make arch top guitars. So um, first of all, the, I guess the first plane that is recovered by archeologists dates from 79 AD from Pompeii. And then there's some other Roman planes from 200 to 400 AD that are kind of similar that um, were found in the British Isles. And I guess there's furniture and other articles made maybe two or 3,000 years before that that show evidence of planing and plane marks, but we don't have the tools from those times. The Roman planes look like hand planes to us. And uh, of course, it's, a, it's, an, it's an old idea, certainly. Basically, it's a, a holder, um, usually a two-handed holder for a knife so that we can take a controlled small cut on a piece of wood. Seems like even the ancient planes of the Romans combined uh, metal and non-metal materials. And so here's, here's some wooden planes that I, I bought and used when I was a young guy. Here's, um, these are from, from Europe. They're made of beech and they're uh, held in place with a, with a wedge. Here's one I modified to be a really aggressive profile scrub plane. So I, I cut this down from a, a tool like this to, to behave like a scrub plane for roughing arch tops. Here's a commercial plane that's a combination of uh, wooden and metal construction. You can see it has a regulator and blade adjuster <laughs> that are the same as these other more modern metal planes, all metal planes. These are kind of cool, they're lightweight, they're kind of fun to use, and they come with a, a double iron like this. Let's look just quickly at these, these examples. These are available either with or without corrugations. The corrugation was introduced in the late 19th century by Stanley, I believe, and it was designed to reduce friction, although none of us can detect that it does that. I think these antique tools are great. If, unless they were abused, they're easily brought back into perfect condition. The other thing that's nice about these old Stanley planes is that they're light section, and the whole tool is light particularly compared to some of the high quality handmade planes that are uh, available new on the market today, which tend to be heavier section and heavier tools. They're quite fatiguing to use in my experience. Anyway, I love these old Stanley planes and uh, they're still available for short money uh, used. And in case anybody wonders where all the nice Brazilian rosewood went, um, all you flat top guitar makers can read it and weep, it all turned into plane handles for, for uh, Stanley planes, brush backs, all kinds of little household appliances they used Brazilian rosewood for because it was such a nice wood to, uh, to look at and handle and didn't really need much of a finish to feel like a finished plane handle. Here's one by a funny company called Siegley. And this has an interesting regulator. You can see this has this kind of funny slot in the blade to regulate the, the side to side and an unusual cap iron. This is also a single iron plane. I'll talk about that in a minute. So this doesn't have a, a cap iron the way most of these beveled down planes have. The cap iron is um, a refinement designed 
to handle the chip. Well, maybe we'll talk about that now. There's roughly two kinds of uh, planes. There's, there's planes that are, are bevel down, like this plane, where the bevel is down. So if this is an iron with a bevel, this would be a bevel down condition. So in other words, this would be the bottom of the plane, and here's the iron, typically sharpened at a 25 degree angle, probably not less than 25, but anyway, something like 25, sometimes greater than 25. You'll see that this gives us a huge amount of clearance here, which is nice because as you sharpen the, this uh, blade, it's, uh, the tendency is to focus on sharpening the edge, and this 25 degree angle gets increased naturally by the woodworker, uh, typically, um, and then that, but that's okay because we have so much clearance angle here that we can tolerate that. Now I was talking about a double iron, which is a configuration like this, where there's a chip breaker, cap iron, either one, um, that's designed to come down here and, and help control the chip so that when the, um, the wood is cut, instead of sliding up this surface of the top of the iron, it gets controlled by this surface, which kind of rolls it up into a, a curl. And that's why, that's why shavings are typically uh, rolled up like this. You can see it rolls it up into a nice curl and it's easy to eject and keep the throat opening free of debris. So in this drawing, the throat opening would be whatever opening there is in front of the blade so that the chip has room to to come out, uh, to come off the material and turn into a, a curl. And then also it, the throat opening is set close enough so that it helps to hold down the wood in front of the cutting iron. And that's important um, in, in a lot of situations. Not in every situation. If you're cutting with the grain, maybe it doesn't matter so much, but a lot of times it's good to have that extra support so that it's pressing down in front of the iron right before it gets cut. Now, to control the throat opening on a, a plane like this, which is a bevel down plane, right, bevel down, we, we have the back of the blade is sitting on this chunk of uh, casting right here, which is called the frog, and this frog is capable of being adjusted uh, you can carefully adjust it by loosening these screws and then regulating with this screw right here, which will drive the frog back and forth in order to get the correct throat opening in front of the cutting edge. All right, so these are all fine-tuning methods, and you can go on YouTube and, and uh, get some, some idea of a variety of different uh, techniques on tuning up your old... Stanley or Bailey plane uh, for optimization. And let me just say that that's, that works fine. These planes are beautiful tools uh, and especially good at creating flat surfaces. So before we go on to optimizing them for non-flat surfaces, let me just introduce the idea of a low angle plane. These are low angle planes where the the bed of this plane is 12 degrees uh, instead of the roughly, usually 45 degree bed angle of the frog. So for this, this condition, we turn the iron over like that so that um, the bevel is up on these planes. And you can see that condition here where the bevel is up and there's no cap iron. Of course, there's no place for the cap iron to, to land. Anyhow, this gives you a different 
a different way to control the cut. This blade is driven directly by this, um, this screw here, this little gizmo. <laughs> and you can regulate the cut in that way. And then on this plane, instead of having a frog that moves back and forth, the whole front part of the plane, the infeed table part of the plane, is capable of being adjusted back and forth to adjust the throat opening in front of the blade. So, two ways to skin the same cat. We're, we're controlling the throat opening, in this case by moving the infeed table of the plane, in this case by adjusting the frog that supports the blade relative to the opening that's already in the plane. Now, here's an interesting plane that combines both of those kind of features. This is a Stanley number 62, a really nice plane in my opinion. Love this guy. So this has an adjustable throat by moving the infeed table and also um, a low angle. So it's bevel up, uh, no cap iron, and it's, and it's adjusted exactly the same way as a block plane. But of course, this is a, a longer plane, about twice as long as a block plane. And you can use, you can get two hands on it and really take a bigger cut or do some fine joinery with it. Really nice tool. And you can get a modern copy of this tool as well. Okay. So two, two ways to do this. Bevel up on a low angle bed or bevel down on a high angle bed. Now, we have to start talking about the things that make the plane work well and work differently in different materials. So there's four major concerns with a, with a hand plane that affect performance. Uh, one is the sharpness of the edge, which is something that, of course, we have control over. The other is the rake angle uh, of the blade. So this would be zero degrees rake and this would be 45 degrees positive rake. If you look at the low bed condition, sometimes these are called low angle planes, these bevel up planes. But here with the bevel up, we're going to add this 25 and the 12 to get 37. So that's clearly less than 45. So this is a high rake plane. Now, the other thing is that by changing this bevel angle, of course, we can adjust the rake of the plane. So that's one advantage of the low bed, so-called low angle plane, is that we can adjust the rake angle, which is a very important angle that uh, for all kinds of cutting tools in wood, but because the, the lower angle is more of a slicing cut and the higher angle is a scraping cut. And then of course we have, um, you know, the, a variety of choices in between. Uh, we noticed that the, uh, the Roman planes that, uh, from uh, the early, you know, about 2000 years ago are relatively high rake. They're 50 to 65 degrees. So they're over here somewhere uh, relative to the stock Stanley planes. Okay, so uh, full disclosure, when I watched over this segment, I thought, you know, I really missed the chance to make something confusing clear. So here I'm going to try it again. So we're going to add a special section here to try and explain this somewhat confusing thing. So if here is a, a plane, well, this is the bottom of the plane here, and here's the uh, the bed angle for the for the blade is 45 degrees and the rake is also 45 degrees and it's the only time when one number makes sense in both of these uh, directions because um, we're going to call the bed angle zero. That's what a plane maker would call the bed angle and that's why 
when the bed angle of this kind of plane is 12 degrees, we're calling this a low angle plane. But let's see what happens. Now we take a, a blade, so here's the thickness of the blade. Sharpness angle is 25 degrees. This is a bevel up condition. We're gonna put this in here. And so to get the, to get the, um, the, this angle, to measure this angle, we add 12 degrees and 25 getting 37 degrees. Now, we can see that 37 clearly is a lower angle than the 45 degrees in a regular bench plane with a frog and the bevel down. Um, so in that sense, this is a true low angle plane. However, if this angle of sharpness is not 25 degrees, if you sharpen it to 30 degrees or even more, you can see how it's sneaking up on this 45 degree line as um, the sharpness angle changes in the plus direction. And so there can be a place where you sharpen the bevel to some larger angle than 25 where the so-called <clears throat> low angle plane isn't behaving like a low angle plane anymore. In other words, low angle, high rake. So this is the problem is that measuring here, bed angle goes up from zero. Measuring rake, rake angle goes up from vertical. It's just how it is. So what we're gonna talk about now is two little things that we can find useful here. One is that if we want uh, less rake, in other words, more rake would be in the slicing direction, positive, and less rake would be in the scraping direction. So we can use a low angle plane and introduce an iron with a, a larger sharpness angle and get any kind of angle we want just by resharpening the blade. So that's kind of useful because we can have multiple irons for this kind of blade that will usefully convert the, the, this tool from a, what we're calling a low angle situation, again, high rake, to uh, a higher angle or a lower, less rake angle. And that would be for hard, maybe harder woods, difficult woods. I think you can see on the, I think we said the Roman planes um, were maybe uh, 50 or even 65 degree bed angle. So they're less rake than uh, a normal modern plane, which is bedded at 45 degrees with a bevel down condition like this plane. All right. So low angle plane just means low bed angle doesn't need to actually function as a low angle plane. Um, depending on how you grind the, ang the angle and the, on the sharpness, the sharpness angle. Okay, now, one other thing I wanted to point out was that when we have a, a plane like this, which has a, uh, two irons together, the cutting blade is, is here, uh, and then a chip breaker is here, um, a, a short distance back from the cutting edge. The chip breaker, as we are gonna look at causes the, the chip that's sliding up this surface to make a curl. And so that's one part of what this does. But the other part I wanted to mention is that what, the other thing that it does is that by clamping these things together, which is done both with a screw here, right? And also, by the cap, which also produces more pressure here when you uh, assemble the plane, produces more pressure and adds to the, adds to the force that the chip breaker is uh, inducing on the end of the plane iron or almost the end of the plane iron. What happens is this sharpness angle, little piece of steel 
that we've spent so much time and trouble to get super sharp gets deflected or bent a tiny amount by the forces provided by the chip breaker. And what that does is it stiffens the iron and very usefully prevents it from wanting to chatter in the cut. So chatter is induced when the iron deflects in the cut. And so then as the iron deflects, it'll move into the material, take a deeper cut than you set it for. And then uh, it'll get um, deflected more than it, than it wants and it'll bend back and so forth. It'll keep going back and forth in this microscopic way and it'll make the plane chatter. I'm sure um, everybody that's used a plane has had that experience. And that's why it happens, is that this part of the tool, the cutting, the cutting edge, is, is uh, cyclically being deflected by bending forces. And the chip breaker is a nice way to stiffen this whole structure so these two pieces of steel conspire and become stronger as a result and make the edge, um, kind of pre-deflect the edge so that it can't get into trouble and chatter. So I hope, <laughs> I hope that this, uh, that this helps clarify things. More rank means more slicing and less rake means more scraping, okay? And the bed angle, calling it low, is just a manner of speech when really it's the rake angle that we care about. This is what the wood knows about. This is what, the, what uh, changes the way the wood behaves when we're entering the wood with a cutting tool, okay? Hope that helps. We're gonna modify one of these spoke shaves to go from a flat bottom to a curved bottom like this. And that's gonna help us to make arch top guitars. And let me point out that although you can get all kinds of information online about flat bottom tools, all kinds of minute about how to sharpen them and the little ruler trick and how to polish the edges, how to adjust the, the frog for the right throat opening, filing and tuning and all of that stuff. But all of those uh, instructional videos are designed for flat bottom tools. And um, that's a two dimensional cut, essentially, you're taking a flat cut. The difference in woodworking um, between two dimensions and three dimensions is kind of the difference between, you know, walking to the corner store and flying an airplane somewhere. One more dimension is a big difference. Um, for one thing, in a curved plane like this, where there's a subtle curve, I think we measured this at about a 20 inch radius arc curve. Um, in order to take the same cut here and here as it does here, this iron has to have exactly the right curvature to match the curve of the sole. Whereas a flat bottom plane, uh, everything has to be straight and then you just adjust it correctly and you're, you're in fat city. But, but here you can see that if you were to grind this, the iron with too much curve in it, it would only cut in the center. And likewise, if you ground it too straight, it would cut first on the edge without cutting on the center. So it's quite a big trick to get these things to work perfectly well. Um, but I think that it's worthwhile doing it because you can control Here's the throat opening by, uh, by a method that I'm going to show you. And we're going we're gonna to turn these uh, ordinary flat spoke shaves into really magic wands for arch top guitar making. The throat opening is super important. The, uh, the sharpness of the iron, of course, we control that. The throat opening, we can't control unless we unless it's adjustable for these on these kind of planes but in a curved plane like this one there's no way to control the throat opening okay and uh, same thing with a spoke shave 
which is also, it's really a plane with a, a, a different shaped sole. In other words, the sole is wide and short instead of being long and narrow. This is still a plane, uh, as, as is this tool, this kind of funny, odd tool uh, made by Stanley from, I don't know, 1877 to 1958, I think. And this is called a box scraper, which it is certainly not. It is a little plane, and, it, and it's, it's curved in, uh, it subtly curved in both directions, just what we want for archtop guitar making. And a bunch of my friends who make cellos have these planes and have tuned them up for their own use. So this is a, a plane that can be either drawn towards you with this handle or pushed away. A very, very cool thing and a nice tool for, um, for removing material. Nice because you can get both hands on it and get your upper body over and lean on it and put some energy into it and get a cut. Well, let's just take a, another look at this plane. This is the same thing, that box scraper, so-called box scraper, number 70 Stanley box scraper. Now these were called scrapers because they functioned to remove um, lettering or stencil paint, that is, from wooden shipping crates so that you could stencil your own address or company name on it. And that's why they're called box scrapers because they were scraping the paint off of a box. But in fact, of course, they're, they're hand planes that are curved in both directions. Now, here's three of them that, that I uh, played with. Let's see. Okay, now I made irons for these tools. You can see on this one, I cut off the little pins that are uh, designed to hold the handle. And um, on this one, uh, we brazed a piece of material on the bottom so that we could get a little bit bigger shape. Um, these, we weren't, these are so thin on the bottom, you can see how thin this is, that you can only get a certain amount of curve by reshaping it before you run out of material and it gets too thin and weak. So these um, Stanley number 70s are really cool. They do a great job. They're kind of they're, they're nice to hold. There's a way to get your thumb in back of it, and you can pull on them. They work pretty well without the handle. And it made me think that I would <coughs> try and make an improved version of that. And so I made this part out of brass, and you've seen me using this tool in some videos, if you've seen my carving videos. Here's one that the same design that got 3D printed um, from stainless, a stainless alloy, stainless and bronze alloy. And then here's one that was cast. This, this plane was cast from silicon bronze and has about a 12 inch radius arc in both directions and works just really, really well. Now, I don't know. If what we're going to do about this. Hopefully, um, my young friend will take on this project and, and produce these planes someday. You'll be able to buy one. We'll see. <laughs> um, and in the meantime, I'm going to show you first how to turn a flat spoke shave into a really super useful tool for carving. While we're at it, we'll also look into making modifications to other tools that you can buy for short money on eBay. Now, here's an Ibex, which is a premium quality plane um, designed by Irving Sloan, a really, really nice plane. I, I don't like these very much because they're hard to hold and they hurt my hands. If I'm trying to take off a lot of work with this plane, I beat my hands up and get tired. If you look up on the violin makers forums, everybody seems to make a handle that sticks out of that with a ball on the end so that you can get a better grip on it. And that's certainly something that you could do to this plane. And here's one 
that's an inexpensive copy from a country far, far away. That's a, a copy of the Ibex plane, and it's pretty good, actually. And we're going to tune this plane up and see if we can't get it to work better, make a handle for it, and so on, see if we can get this to be a more viable plane for those of you who'd like to, who'd like to swim in that pool. And then the other thing we can do is to take a plane like this, also short money on eBay. I think each of these cost about $30. Um, and we can, we can transform this into a nice spherical bottom plane as well that, uh, that may be a lot of fun to use for Art's Top Guitar Making. So we'll do these explorations in uh, films to come. Uh, while I'm here, let me show you some stuff that I did. I've been <laughs> at this a while. These are planes that I made uh, in the late 70s uh, for my own work on archtop guitars. And these are um, Japanese style planes with uh, regular wedge shaped irons. You just drive the iron into the slot till it's the right size cut. And these are designed to be pulled, but they can be pulled or pushed, of course. Here's some smaller ones. And these guys have actually gotten a lot of use over the years. Pretty good tools. The bodies of these planes are made of lignum vitae, which unfortunately is not something that we can buy today. But I think if you look closely at the bottom of this plane, you'll see even that this very, very hard, heavy wood has quite a bit of wear right in front of the cutter where we care about it. Here's another plane. This one, I think, uh, is from 1976. I made this plane out of brass and aluminum, and I made this, um, made this iron out of uh, O1 tool steel, and this actually works quite well. When I made this plane, I was able to use it vigorously enough so that it got too hot to hold. I had to literally set it down because it got over 145 degrees and I couldn't hold it anymore. <laughs> this plane I uh, made in about 2005, I guess. Um, and this is an interesting design because the, the uh, outfeed table and the blade are the same part. And you can see how the cutting edge, edge is uh, shaped in this uh, entertaining curved way. <laughs> and the infeed table is, uh, is there to match it. So to adjust this plane, you just put a uh, shim stock here and just bend this blade up in order to get the size cut you want. Um, this works well if you're working next to a brace in an upright base. I've uh, loaned it to a friend of mine who used it like that and reported that it was just magic for things like that. And then uh, I think 2011, I put this little guy together. And this one has a couple of interesting features, including it has an adjustable sole. So you can see that the, there's wear here and there from rubbing on the, on, the cut, on the wood. And there's also some wear on this part. And this bottom part, the, the back end of the outfeed table can be adjusted with an Allen wrench here, and it, it drives this part of the plane back and forth and kind of changes the shape of the arc a little bit. And it turned out to be a lot of work and uh, not very effective. <laughs> but anyway, the, pl the plane itself works great. Uh, a couple of innovations on this plane. One of them is the iron, you can see, is a, is a quarter inch thick tool steel. This is A2 tool steel, which is an air hardening um, tool steel, very nice quality. And in order um, to control the throat opening, you can see the throat opening on all of these planes is just huge. I mean, these are just giant throat openings, the same as 
the same as this kind of tool, this uh, Stanley, what is this? A hundred and a half, I guess. Yeah. Again, because we can't adjust the throat opening the way we can on, on this number 62, and we can't adjust the frog going back and forth the way we can on all the S Stanley bench planes, we don't really have any control over this critical distance between the edge, uh, cutting edge, and the, the uh, last support of the infeed table of the plane. So that's a disadvantage for working in difficult woods and certainly for cutting against the grain. It's a disaster and this plane will, any of these planes will rip out the wood something awful if you go the wrong way. And if you've tried it, you know what I'm talking about. So this was the first plane that I was able to design and build that has a terrific control over this opening. And the way it's done, I think you can see that there's a little milled step right here. So this surface from here on back touches the plane blade. But from here to there is a little step. So this is a little lower than surface than it is here. And what that allows me to do is um, even though the, the blade has a curve in it, I can still adjust the throat opening perfectly just by varying the step between um, this surface and that surface. And when I was doing that, I, I determined that, at least for this plane, what I needed was um, two thousandths clearance. So I, I wanted to take a five thousandths thick cut as my heaviest cut that I would ever use with this tool. I found out that when I took a five thousandths cut with a five thousandths opening, of course, um, no surprise, the shavings got stuck and it didn't clear the, the shavings and was a pain in the neck. So I added a thousandth clearance by just precisely milling this, this surface down one more thousandth. It wasn't quite enough, and that's how I determined that a 7,000 opening was capable of passing a 5,000 shaving without um, any fuss at all. So you can take a 5,000 shaving, which is <laughs> a pretty big cut for a hand plane, and if you don't think so, um, just try it sometime. See how exhausted you get trying to take off cuts bigger than five. The other interesting thing about this plane is I couldn't figure out what kind of handle I wanted for it. So I, I brazed on these two um, stainless stu tubes and then um, I made a little wooden handle for it, which is, turns it into a great one or maybe two handled tool that works really well. Of course, it's still, you can still use it without the handle if you like. And then I made this other handle out of aluminum rod where I drilled a hole in each end of the rod and then bent it so that you get a, a nice a nice two-handed grip if you want if you are taking a heavy cut a five thousandths cut for it you can get in there and, and really lay into it and uh, get your body over it and push down and get a good cut so pretty cool tool and then um, I'll point out also that the the adjustment here, that's your adjustment for the depth of cut. This advances the blade relative to this back part of the plane and shifts it in and out. And it's controlled this way by these pins and really can't be adjusted side to side. So you have to just grind it right. But Fortunately, we know how. All right, what else have I got? Just a couple of cute planes I'll show you on the way out. Here's a um, little tiny low angle plane 
This is super low angle. I think this is even 11 degrees. So it's even um, lower than the Stanley 12 degree plane, which is really pushing it because what the limitation of the low, this low angle bed design, of course, is that there's not a lot of material in here. And if you look for a used one of these, you might see one that has little cracks in the bed here and here. And that's from somebody um, applying way too much pressure. And unfortunately, although these are kind of cool toggle levers, they, are, they do multiply the force. So you can adjust this screw too low, put this, uh, put this in here and lean on it until you bust the casting here and here and you'll see if you look on eBay you'll see a bunch of them are broken like that. I don't think those are worth getting and um, I don't think they're repairable in any sense of the word really. So that's the limitation of these uh, low angle planes is that the, the bed is fragile right where you care about it. On the other hand it really is a terrific design and this particular block plane, should put in a plug here, is my absolute favorite kind. It's a number 65, and it has a wider iron than most block planes. It's got the uh, 1 and 5 eighths inch wide iron, and it has this, um, you know, the low angle bedway and direct drive with a screw. These, <laughs> the, neither of these planes are original as originally supplied. These ones are original supplied. So this one has, you know, this knurled knob and a dual action. It has a dual action thread. So there's a, a different thread in here than there is in here. And it gives um, a nice fine adjustment by subtracting the difference of the threads. So it acts like a super fine adjustment, but with relatively coarse threads, so it's, it stays strong. And these are two competitors. This one is, I don't know, Miller's Falls, I think. And this one says Craftsman. This one's seen better days. But this is a, this is a lovely tool. This would clean up great. You know, you could get a, a beautiful surface like this on it and make sure that everything is super flat. Again, this is my favorite block plane. I love these things. The perfect size for your hand, not too heavy. You can really get some good support and, and use it uh, sensitively. I probably use this plane more than any other flat plane uh, in guitar making. Here's a rabbit plane. Um, this one is also, uh, so anyway, rabbit plane means that there's no sides in the iron can cut the full width of the plane, and it's spelled R-A-B-B-E-T. This plane also has an adjustable throat opening, which um, you can see is set quite fine now, and is adjustable by loosening this screw, and then there's a, a set screw inside that regulates the position of the front of the plane, the infeed side, so that when you, after you sharpen it and put it back together, it'll come to rest in the same place. Um, and this, this is a example of a plane that this iron cannot be removed without removing the front of the plane, just the way it's designed. Okay. And what else? Oh, this one was made by my wonderful late friend, Ken Wisner. This is a copy of a Stanley 95. It has a, a straight blade, but it's set at a skew angle, so that's, that's really good. We talked about why that's good in the tool geometry thing. And it's got this, um, this cool lever adjustment here, where this, this lever is just a simple adjustment, like a rack and pinion without a screw. And Ken 
took a Stanley plane on, and uh, copied it and had it cast in bronze. And uh, just a fantastic, fantastic cool tool uh, made by a master machinist and inventor. And I believe that actually this is the beginning of the Lee Nielsen or Lie Nielsen Tool Company. I can never figure out how to say it. He sold his patterns to Mr. Nielsen and that's how Mr. Nielsen got his start was with this plane, a copy of a Stanley 95. Beautiful thing. As Ken used to say, it trims the edge of three-quarter plywood as if designed for the purpose. But because it's so old, we know it wasn't because there wasn't any plywood when it was designed. Here's a cool plane I had to show you because this one is, it has an adjustable sole and nothing else in the world of planes has a crazy feature like this. You can adjust the sole to be either convex or concave. A little tricky to set up, but man, these things can really solve a problem. So you could just adjust this to any curve you want. And a uh, particularly nice pattern. No marks on this plane. I don't know who made it. But really, really well made. Beautiful tool. Planes. Sharpness. Rake. Throat opening. Ease of adjustment. Right? And rigidity. Those are the things that contribute to the success of a plane. And if your plane isn't working right, it's probably one of those things that's not optimized. And uh, as I said, I'm going to try and show you how to change the shape of a, a plane like a uh, spoke shave like this and curve it for arch top work and also how to permanently adjust and close the throat opening to uh, provide excellent support and control of material right before the cutting edge gets involved with it. That's how we're going to outsmart the wood and try and get a beautiful finish even when we're roughing it.